So I, I know that today's interview was just a little bit different. So, you know, a lot of times when people come on, on stream, like it's all about negative emotions and, and things like that. And, you know, people are crying and whatnot, but I think it's important to remember that really the goal of the stream is to be like educational, right. And help people understand different slices of life. And a lot of times those slices of, of life are a little bit negative, but it's interesting because a lot of the questions we get are like, how do I do this? Like, how do I become successful? How do I understand the flow state? How do I enter the flow state? How do I, you know, what, what are the pieces of that? And the really interesting thing about Lyle is, um, I think he's, he's done a good job of like stumbling on a lot of this stuff through his own explorations. And so it's really more a little bit about understanding the flow state, like how to do creative work, how to be a little bit successful by carving out your own niche. Um, and those are all like important topics for people as well. So I know that sometimes it's not quite as, you know, entertaining in terms of like voyeurism, but hopefully it was helpful to people who are curious about this kind of stuff. Anyway, welcome, friend. So just... well, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. I see you are, uh, you appear to be a gecko. I, I, I do appear to be a gecko. I uh, I spent, like, while you were running late, I actually, I was glad you were running late because it gave me some time to, like, I was trying to screw around with my uh, background because I normally have, like, clouds or outer space or something, but uh, uh -huh. it, it, did, it didn't work. Yeah, so um, can you tell me what you go by? Like, what do you want me to call you? Should I call you? Yeah. How do I uh, you, 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 just, you can You can just call me Lyle. That works. Okay. Lyle? Yeah, so tell me a little bit, um, you know, do you have a, is there a particular topic that we're talking about today or, um, you know, something in particular that interests you? I don't know. I guess the, there's like a sort of, maybe it's trite, but like the idea of, you know, what's, what's, what, you know, if you're a, a, a person who, you know, talks to people about their problems on the computer, it's like, what are your problems? You know, but I don't know, that felt cliche to me, in a way. Isn't you asking me what my problems are, or I'm asking you what your problems are? I guess, I guess you asking me what my problems are. But I think this is sort of interesting because, well, I mean, you're a real therapist, and I'm a gecko guy. Yeah, I mean, are you, are you not a real therapist? No. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, did you not know that? No, I, I, I wasn't sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I hope I didn't like, I, I hope I, I didn't want to feel like I was tricking you. No, I, I mean, I, I, I think you're pretty transparent in, in, you know, that this is a character and an act. And at the same time, I actually, you know, have no idea about what your educational background is or things like that. So I try not to assume, sure. but um, sure. if you want to, you know, talk about or share uh, something about maybe things that you struggle with or stuff like that, sometimes people like to get a different perspective. Um, sure. And so we can definitely do that. Uh, a lot of times people will want to talk a little bit about stress related to, you know, being a particular character. I think interestingly enough, um, you know, it's very overt that you are a character, I'd assume, once again, that Lyle, once the makeup comes off and the gecko suit comes off, that you're a different person. But one of the things that I notice with a lot of content creators is that it can be hard because their content creator personality can conflict or almost like even dominate their like real personality. And that can be really hard to kind of struggle with. Um, yeah. So, well, it's yeah. funny you say that because I actually, I don't feel like I am all that uh, different uh, from who I really, I really, I mean, I feel like every like, you know, uh, you know, online persona is just like an exaggerated version of who the person actually is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that I'm as much of a character I think that the, the the being on camera and broadcasting myself is like what what would make me a character more so than the fact that I'm wearing a, a gecko costume. I actually I made a I made a pretty intentional like uh decision not to like hammer so hard into a character because like, you know, it's it's one thing if you're like, you know, Borat and you're like making a skit for three minutes or something but like if you're streaming for hours and hours and hours a day and I'm you know up there talking about eating bugs or whatever you know that just I feel like that would just have gotten exhausting if I had like committed really hard to like I am a gecko and all that you know yeah so what I'm hearing is that to retain some of your sanity 
you can't yes. go too far away from being your authentic self. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's well said. I, I think it. So can you just tell me a little bit, Lyle, about... Um, so, you know, if you're okay with it, I'll just ask you a couple of questions about how you got to where you are. And then if there's something that um, maybe we can talk about that would be interesting to you or helpful, like by all means. Um, and then if you've got questions for me, you know, feel free to jump in at any point. So can you just tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got to being a therapy gecko on the internet? Sure. Um, well, it was a uh, quarantine and uh, I started um, going live on Instagram with my friends just sort of screwing around and talking about nothing. And like there would be, you know, two people from my high school watching and uh, it was a lot of fun. I liked live streaming and I sort of thought like, oh, I wonder if like I could kind of do this like in front of people who do not know me. And uh, so I kind of had that thought in the back of my head. And then uh, so there was that. And then I made this other like YouTube video uh, where I and one of the one of the costumes was was a gecko. So I had a gecko costume. That's, that's prong two. And then uh, do you know about Reddit streaming? Like, do you sort know what of. RPAN is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that like, Reddit tries to get me to watch their live stream a lot. But it, it yeah, everyone hates easy. them. The top. The top post, it's it's a uh, it's called RPAN. Yeah. And the top post every week in RPAN is how do I disable RPAN? Yeah. So everyone really doesn't like them. But uh, I I started stream. I found RPAN and I thought it was really interesting and like uh, a cool community because it's it's sort of different from Twitch because Twitch is like gaming focused and RPAN is like more sort of anything. Um, and so the combination of those three things, I started streaming on uh, Reddit as a lizard and and uh posting clips from tiktok and all of a sudden it, it became what i do to exist wow so how long did it take to become what you do to exist what are we talking about in terms of a journey here fairly quickly uh like you know i i started on um our pan and then i started a, i started a twitch like two months after that, and my Twitch sort of grew enough that it became like a lucrative thing to do, and now it's I am I am therapy gecko. Awesome, man. Guy. So how is how's that journey been for you? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been cool. Um, how has it been? Um, it happened really fast. I feel very grateful because I know a lot of people like you know I I don't I've only been streaming for like. A year and a half, and and I know that it it takes a lot to get a stream off the ground. So I I feel uh, you know, grateful that I I was able to kind of make this into a thing pretty pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. A year and a half. I I can't tell if that's really. I mean, it sounds like on the one hand it's fast, right? Because some people will stream for years and slowly grow, and on yeah. the other hand, it's still like a year and a half of your your life, bro. Yeah, like, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So it sounds like you've been working at it for a while and putting in kind of thought and effort. And yeah, and you know, I'd I'd been like do I'd been like m making things on the internet for like you know since I was like thirteen years old, you know, I, and I I did a uh, stand up from the time I was like sixteen to uh, like twenty two. So I'd been like, I guess if you could call Twitch streaming performing, you know, performing. Uh, you know, for for a while. Wow, that's interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about what drew you to making things on the internet at the age of thirteen? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I I had this uh like I had this I can't describe it, but I had this like internet show thing when I was thirteen. I called it I Weekly, and uh, I was just ripping off of Robot Chicken. Like I would take like little dolls and stuff and like act out little things and then like cut to another little thing with dolls or McDonald's toys I had lying around. That was actually, that was when I was in like fifth grade, I think. And uh, wow. I've been pretty much making stuff on the internet since then. So what drew you to making stuff on the internet in the fifth grade? I don't know. I think that that's like a sort of <laughs> like, like pot, like, Every every kid wants to be like an internet 
star in a way. Like you would see like Fred and Smosh and shit and be like, oh, that is cool. I want to have as many, you know, YouTube subscribers as Fred. And so you just start making stupid videos on the internet, which is interesting because I feel like that's gotten, I feel like that's multiplied itself by 10,000 now with, uh, you know, TikTok and all that. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you were, you actually like, you know, you've created stuff and you were looking almost like you had a goal in mind, right? Which was that you wanted to be like these people who had a lot of subscribers and, and created content and. I think so. I think so. I'm trying to, it's so hard. I, I, I'm so bad at going into like my past with, I, Man, whenever I, I hear people like uh, whenever I hear someone like give a, 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 a intricate story about their childhood, I'm like, how the hell do you remember that? I'm like trying to think about what my motivations were when I was in fifth grade, and I don't know how deep they were, but I that that sure. that, that, that might have that might have been it. Yeah, no, I, and by the way, Lyle, it's it's completely normal to not have you know not remember what you were thinking in the fifth grade. I I thank you, yeah, thank you. You know, so for, like for like validating that. So the interesting thing is if you really look at like memories from our past, yeah. generally speaking, I, I think, um, you know, the prevailing theory, or at least the one that I subscribe to is that most of them are constructed after the fact. Mm. So like, I'm really surprised when my kids will like remember things from when they were, I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. So they'll like, remember, like my six-year-old will remember things from when she was three. I don't think she remembers. I think she just has heard the stories. And so she constructs a memory. So a lot of times, yeah. So like a lot of times, if you really kind of look at it, and there's some meditation techniques and stuff around this as well, most of what we remember are impressions, and then the narrative that you hear people construct, or the narrative that you hear people share, is actually constructed based on like some kind of memory impression. Um, and so there's like a lot of blanks being sort of filled in. Yeah, after the absolutely. Fact. So you kind of have like some kind of imprint. And then, you know, like you fill it in and then like human beings try to form narratives about themselves. It seems to be yeah. incredibly adaptive. And so, you know, at some point, you know, in your mind, you're kind of conceptualizing who you are and how you've become a gecko and what it means to be Lyle as a gecko and where is the Lyle and what is the gecko. So I think it's normal to not, you know, have well-constructed memories. Um, and That's even awesome. people... Even people like myself who will, you know, tell stories and my stories come across as coherent from my past tend to be like storytelling, right? It's not like I really, I mean, I'll, I'll have particular memory impressions, which are powerful and emotional. And then since I'm, you know, then I'll construct a narrative around that, which then makes sense to other people. And so you're like exaggerating certain parts of it to fit in, to like make a, a story? I wouldn't like say that. a clear that, beginning, middle and end? Yeah, so I wouldn't call it exaggeration, but I'd say that if you really think about it, what you're doing is filling in the gaps, absolutely, right? So, and our mm. mind does this automatically. Like, as it makes sense of things, you'll kind of reinterpret things and then realize, oh, the reason I did that was because, you know, so for example, like, you know, the reason I got bullied is maybe because of, you know, I was a year younger than everyone in my class and everything was related to sports and stuff like that. So I was like a five-year-old competing against six-year-olds. And so that's the reason that I sucked at sports was because, you know, a six-year-old will destroy a five-year-old in basically any sport. Yeah. Um, and as a, actually, I started school when I was four. So I was like a four-year-old competing against five-year-olds. And so it was like not even a contest. And then impressive. I can say that no, it wasn't impressive. It was actually, I got, I got rolled. But Although it was impressive <laughs> that you, 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 were, you were four, but you decided to do it anyway, even if you were scared. Yeah, so you know that that's see, see there that's kind of interesting what you did there because you said I decided to do it anyway because I was scared. So if you say something like that, it constructs a narrative of me being impressive. But ah. actually, what happened is I go to PE. I dread PE every single day. I don't have a choice. I know if I cry, I'm going to get bullied more. So it wasn't like a testament to my bravery. It was like you know being marched off to the you know like a the noose every single day 
And so mm. it was it was a harrowing experience. But as we kind of put that together, even that is sort of like I remember the fear. And so what I'll do is like fill in the gaps around it to kind of construct a narrative about my experience. Right. And you can reframe it to say that you were brave. Sure. I mean, I, I try not to, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. Sometimes people will reframe things to make themselves appear better or more noble. And, uh, in my experience, that doesn't actually help. And being honest about your negative emotions and when things are hard for you is actually healthier, but that's just like my that. tip. I like that. So what do you kind of remember about growing up and what was growing up like for you? I grew up in a suburban Jewish neighborhood. Uh, we we did all. I I went to Hebrew school. Uh, I went to sleepaway camp. I was thinking about camp today because like years ago I was at the Jewish community center camp. That was fun. Uh, I had a. Let's see. My parents divorced when I like two thousand. Four, maybe. That was a big. That was a. That was a big thing. Um. How old were you at the time? Ah oh man, I was. How fucking old was I? Like young. Like I had to be like six or seven or something like that. Okay. And you said that was a big thing. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know. It's just like like I don't like think about it that much because like it doesn't affect me that much in my current life it's something i never think about like you know i know it's like for a lot of families it's devastating but for me it wasn't that like big of a deal i guess but like i remember like i just i don't know i just remember like that being a big thing when it happened which i guess makes sense in a way i know this may sound like kind of a weird question lyle but in what it, way was it. it a big thing uh, I don't know. Maybe I just said that. I I I I don't have like a bit. It, it I guess it wasn't a big thing. Now that I, now that I think about it. So let's let's learn for a second, okay? So I'm gonna make oh, an observation, okay? So do it. Remember, we said that when you're young, you have just impressions. Mm -hmm. Yes. But when I ask you about it, you don't have clear memories, and so before you walk yourself back from the big thing chances are the only impression that you got left with was that it was big, yeah. right? Sure. Which is literally exactly what we were just talking about. And so if I ask yeah. you about it and you're not able to provide answers, it doesn't mean it wasn't a big thing. It just means mm. you were six. Yes. And so like, what are you going to remember yes, about that is correct. The, the complexities of why your parents get divorced yes. when you're six? That is correct. It was a big <laughs> thing. I can't dive further into it because I was six and have... I, I cannot form other words to say sure that creates it yeah. being a bit but I, just, I but I remember like when I was you know I mean it was a big thing in my family and like when I was like you know by the time that both of my parents had remarried it was like I mean it was actually kind of a great thing in a way because I mean the circumstances of it uh you know might not have been as great but like it, it ended up being good because they they my my mom and my dad are not very uh like compatible with each other they're kind of polar opposites so it's kind of it's good that they remarried to other people got it so it sounds like it ended for the best ended for the best exactly yeah so just to think a little bit about constructing narratives so yes. we're going to toss out a couple of things okay let's do it so you remember how you were kind of saying that people will reinterpret things and make themselves potentially feel braver, right? We'll tell ourselves tell ourselves stories that result in like positivity and the reframing of negative things into positive things. Yeah, yeah. So a very common thing that I hear, have no idea if this is actually the case with you, but just for something for you to think about, is oftentimes sure. divorce sucks for kids. Sure. And sometimes what children will do is in order to kind of smooth everything over and not be angry and resentful to our parents for throwing our life into chaos at the age of six, what we'll do is the whole family will share and construct a narrative of it's for the best because mom and dad are both happier now and it's good to have happy parents for happy sure. kids. 
And and I'm not saying that that's right or wrong or or whatever. It's just a common pattern that I've seen that a lot of people sure. will kind of reinterpret things in that way. And I'm not talking because I have no idea what exactly happened with your parents or anything like that. Sure, but sure. It, it's just such a common occurrence for us to say, oh, like divorce actually was for the best. Like sometimes, you know, I, I will say things about that in terms of my life. Like I'll say like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, failing out of college was a really formative experience for me and made me who I am, which is absolutely true. But yes. also it was awful. Like it was a terrible experience to go through. Sure, sure. I will say I I do believe that the uh, – idea that everything happened for the best is something i genuinely decided on my own i don't think it was like a like i i, I wouldn't i don't I, I don't look at it at all as like a narrative i crafted to like have to deal yeah. with like and I, I totally think that it was it was for the best. i mean i don't think like yeah I, I i don't remember like uh you know i don't i don't really have like any it's not it's not a tragic sort of part of my life or anything like that i genuinely sure. do believe it's it was it was for the best and can you help me understand how you came to that genuine decision? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, I mean, just looking up who my parents, like, you know, just looking at who they're with now. Yeah. Versus like, w- like, versus like each other, like their spouses are who they're currently married to are like, you know, and any, anyone could look at them and say objectively, they are much better with the people they are with now sure. than uh, the people that they, you know, each other. So I'm hearing that you're, you're both of your parents married far more compatible people. Oh, for sure. And, and so as a result, you know, it's like a no brainer that they're like with compatible people and being in a relationship with someone that you're compatible with is objectively better than being someone in a relationship with someone that you're not compatible with, which makes perfect 100%. sense. And it doesn't 100%. have to be some kind of weird psychological re, you know, retelling of history or anything like that. It's just like, honestly, yeah, like, exactly. they just weren't right for each other and they found yeah. people who I were. almost, I feel like, I feel nerve, like not nervous about this, but like I do, I, I, you know, when talking to you, I, I want to, I'm tr- trying to be conscious about like, like in my, like I, like my parents' divorce is not like a big, like I, I don't believe that like we would go down this whole rabbit hole that would be like, oh, the, my parents' divorce is actually, it's the root of my entire problem. Like I, I genuinely don't believe that. I'm trying not to talk in a way that would lead us down that rabbit hole because I don't think it would be, I don't think it would lead anywhere. Yeah, sure. So what do you way, think would lead somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> I thought I was kind of, you know, I, you know, what I thought was kind of funny is uh, I was, uh, I was like watching some of your stuff. Uh, I'm a fan. And I was watching to like prepare to come here. And I heard you were talking to a uh, poke. You were talking to Pokemane and you said, you asked her what you should, you should call her. And uh, you said like, poke, she's like, Pokemane is more of a character. And you said, you don't like characters. And I was like, oh, I'm about to show up on this guy's stream. He hates characters. I'm going to show up as a gecko. And wh- wh- what what was the conclusion that your mind came to from that? I don't know. I think. But I don't know. I, I'm not really. A, I guess we already sort of talked about this, but I'm not really like a character or anything. Is it important but... for you to show up in a way that I would like? Uh, I, I guess so. I mean, I don't want to, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to piss you off by showing up as a gecko, but yeah. Would it be okay if you did piss me off? I'd like to not piss you off. I appreciate that. Feeling is mutual. And would it be okay if you did piss me off? I think I could. I think I could get over it if I if I pissed you off. Yeah. I w- I don't want to piss you off, but I don't. Th- I w- it wouldn't. It wouldn't destroy me if I pissed you off. Yeah, and I, I I'm I'm happy to hear that because I think you know we're not here for you to make me happy. Sure. Right. Sure. That's not why we're here. And sure. I'd say if if you piss me off, I'd say like you know me getting pissed off is more on me. Now if you're acting in a way that's like toxic or disrespectful or malicious, then I think sure. that is fair to blame. But I mean, you get to come on here in whatever way you want to. Sure. Right? And sure. if I don't like it, that's something I have to deal with. It's not your responsibility. Yeah, I agree with I feel like if 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 for whatever if if me wearing a gecko suit, I didn't I don't I don't think I really genuinely thought 
I would I was going to piss you off. But even but like that's the thing is if I did if me wearing a gecko suit really did piss you off, that I that would that I agree that would be a you problem. Yeah. All the more power to you, dude. I I'm thrilled. The only real concern I have about the gecko suit is I'm curious about whether the makeup is, you know, safe to wear on a prolonged basis. And whether you've talked Dr. to Dr. K, I went that. to a dermatologist. I went to Thank a dermatologist, God. Dr. K. Well done. And, they, and, I, and, I, and I, I went to a dermatologist and I told them that I wear uh, green paint. And they didn't ask why, but I told them I wear green <laughs> paint for 20 hours a week. And they were, and I said, uh, is, am I, and I asked them, like, am I going to die? And they said, uh, you'll probably be fine. Perfect. Great. I'll probably be fine, Dr. K. <laughs> I'm so glad that you sought real medical advice for that. That's honestly the only concern that I have about the gecko suit. Otherwise, it's like, you know, people have dye their hair, people wear makeup, people, sure. you know, wear whatever. And it's like, you do you, bro. Thank you, Dr. You know? K. I appreciate that. And, you know, kind of going back, you, you were saying, like, you, divorce isn't the root of the problem. I'm sold. I'm not worried about it. It's just sometimes for cool. some people it is. You know, I think, sure. you, like you said, sure. you kind of said they just weren't compatible. And they're like, it's like not that big of a deal. Totally fine, man. And sure. then I got kind of sure. curious sure. about you said, like, oh, it's like the root of my problems. But then I'm curious, like, what, what do you mean when you say problems? Like, what are your problems? Do you have problems? Do I have problems? I think, I think, well, I think everyone has problems. What are my problems? Um, hmm. Well, I don't know. Right now, I'm having, I'm enjoy, I'm having a good time. Okay. I don't think I'm trying to think of the last time. I I feel like I really had a problem. I don't know. I I my, I love it's pretty good right now. i have like I I'm 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 pretty grateful for where I'm at. Right now. I mean, everyone, like, you know, complains about shit. But, like, if I were to actually, like, you know, take... It, it, like, in the moment that I just did where I had to think, like, what like what are my problems to talk to Dr. K about? I'm like, I, I'm I'm pretty, pretty grateful for my life right now. I think in a large scale, I, I don't think I have any, any yeah, glaring so problems. I, I, I think, you know, I'm okay not fishing or digging for them if you're okay sure. not with if you're okay with me not doing that like did you come on here with the hopes that i would uncover or unearth some problem because if so we can go down that route and i could try harder but there's a ton of stuff that i'm curious about and i think that we can talk about that could be like oh, useful. i would love to talk about the stuff that you are curious about yeah so dude tell me about stand-up bro like that's why <laughs> uh that was fun i um I started when I was 16 years old, like, because I, I really, because the thing was, the reason I started when I was 16 is because, I, I mean, I wanted to do it since I was 13, but I really did not want my mom or dad to, like, watch me, so I waited until I got my driver's license so I could go alone, um, and so I did that, and then I started, like, uh, it was, it was, it was fun, I would, like, uh, you know, I was 16 and it was like there would be like a school night and I my mom was fucking really cool and she would let me like drive down into the city to hang out at like a punk club until 1 a.m. waiting to go on at the open mic and then I'd come back and wake up at six and go into high school and I'm like you fuckers do your intramural soccer and your frisbee but I'm doing the cool thing here you know um but yeah, that was it was fun. Um, I, sounds... I just kind of stopped doing it, um, cause uh, I don't know. I just got I I, I like I like I like streaming more than stand up because stand up you kind of do alone, um, like when like when you have to write it, like you sit in a fucking dark room and you have to like bang everything out. But what I like about streaming is like if you have a if you have something that you want to express, like a feeling or a thought or something, you just you literally just say it. And it and it and the purest form of what you just said is what makes it to the person that is ingesting it, as opposed to like, you know, a a tweet or something where you yeah write 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 your thought, go ah that's not the perfect way to say it, delete it, right ah that's not the perfect way to say it, delete it, you know. While you strike me as someone for whom like authenticity is like very important. Absolutely, like you, yeah. 
you know, like, like what I'm hearing is that there's a certain amount of sterilization that goes into tweeting and, and, you know, crafting jokes and changing, editing words and things like that. I mean, I think one way yeah. to look at it as craftsmanship, I think another way to look at it is sterilization, right? Like it's like, sure. it's, it's crafted. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, processed. It's not all mm -hmm. natural. Absolutely. And, and on stream, and I'm also kind of noticing, like, even when it comes to, you know, being a gecko, it seems like the gecko isn't, is really just, you know, something that you kind of put on, but we're not really becoming a different person. No, not really. Um, I mean, I like, I like being the gecko. I, I think it's, um, I will say, I think it's easier. I, don't, I wouldn't even say this, but like, I, I, I like being slightly removed from myself, even though I'm not like, you know, I go by lot, like when I'm gecko, like I go by Lyle or Gek or whatever, but it is, it is, it's, it's fun to be an ent to speak as like an entity as, as opposed to like yourself. What you know? makes, I, what I, I, makes I don't, it fun to speak as an entity? Uh, I don't know. Like being, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of how to go deeper into that, but like, it's, I like, I like speaking as a, I mean, I, I stream as myself too. Like, I mean, I, I guess I am always streaming as myself, but, uh, I stream not wearing the gecko costume. Um, I don't know. It's like, I, I like, okay. So the biggest, the thing on like, uh, the reason why I think that like my stream has, has worked for me is like, if I, if I got up on Twitch and I was like, this, my name is Lyle Drescher, and this is the Lyle Drescher Show. Call in and ask me, Lyle, for advice or something. And people be like, who is, I don't know who this guy is. What the, who cares? You know, scroll or whatever. But like, presenting myself as this like, it's, it's like a, it's like a being that I feel like can be more easily identified with than like, just some other random fucking guy, you know? And I, and I, hmm. and I like that, you know? I think that that is more, more interesting. I'm going to use a weird word here, please. Um, but I, I almost almost getting the sense that you're channeling the therapy gecko. <laughs> I totally channel the therapy gecko, a hundred percent. You know, that's, it doesn't sound like an word. act. It, it sounds like you become a conduit or yes. a medium. Yes, yes, I definitely feel like I channel the therapy. And if I and I will say, if I'm trying hard to channel therapy gecko. I don't. I don't want to say it's different from myself because I believe that like ev every part of like like I don't know if, if if people are so complex like I feel like every I wouldn't say that me my channeling of the gecko is like a different from me. I would say it is a part of me. So I don't want to say it's playing a character, but it is like different than how I would be if I were just like you know having a conversation with someone you know off stream or something. Lyle, I have a concern that this conversation may completely go off the rails. Um, I, I'm, I, let's, let's, let's do it. So, like, here's the thing. So, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if there ain't no problems to talk about, totally fine, right? So, I think one of the biases that people have is they assume that people come on to the stream explicitly to talk about problems, and that's what we're interested in. But I, I think what the stream sure. is really about is understanding people. Hell yeah. And so, in a weird way, uh, what I kind of want to talk to you about, what I think is interesting to hear about, um, mm -hmm. is create a process, success, yeah. Yeah. and actually like flow. Like, are you familiar yes. with the site? I love, I love the, I always say, I always say like, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to give advice too often, but like, I, I do feel like, um, Isn't on my stream, I talk show to about giving advice. Oh, we're going to get off on a tangent if I start <laughs> talking about that, but, um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but like flow, flow. Uh, I love. I, yeah, because I, I really, I, I genuinely feel like uh, you know people are always like trying to like, how can I be happy? But I feel like flow is better than happiness. Well, help me understand why flow is better than happiness. I, I, I don't know, cause flow, cause happiness just feels like pa passive in a way. Like flow is like all encompassing, and it's 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 very. I don't know, I like it. Like I like I feel like I'm in flow right now talking to you. I feel like I'm in f that's why I like streaming is cuz I feel like when and it doesn't always happen, you know, streaming can, you know, it's it's not great 100% of the time, but like when it is, it's like 
I'm in I'm in flow state. I'm fully engrossed in the conversation that I'm having, and that's that's when I feel the best is is when I'm in a flow state. I'd like to be in a flow state as much as I possibly can. Reasonable. I'm almost hearing you kind of say that happiness is sort of like you kind of said it's passive, and being in a flow state is like alive. It's like vibrant yeah. and experienced. It's not like yes. a a calculation about like oh am I like happy like yeah I'm happy like you can s- you say that kind of in the abstract right like if someone yeah, asks well, like, you are okay, you happy so, it's like well, you yeah, know okay. like 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 yeah like you could sit around like like if you're sitting in a chair in your big house and you have a bunch of money and you have a loving family and you like are piecing look you're thinking about your life and you're like oh I'm happy you know I got good stuff going on I'm really grateful for my life like that's good but I like but like when you're when you're in a flow state, it's it's you're not you're not even fucking thinking. You're just doing. You're being. You're in the you're fully in the present. And I and I think that that's when people are most happy is when because when they're when they're in the present, not when they're like thinking about their life from this ethereal, you know, yeah. sort of step ladder position or whatever. Yep. Yeah. So it sounds like you know sometimes when you ask the question, "Are you happy?" What people do is they make an abstract or intellectual judgment. Mm-hmm. about whether the person in their situation should be happy. Sure. And then they absolutely. will say, "Yes. I have the big house and the big chair." Yes. And and interesting that you use the word chair there. <laughs> you know, the big chair. <laughs> but I like I like I like the way that you phrase that. Like, I like the way that you phrase that like thinking, "Should a person who has what I have be happy?" as opposed to, "Am I happy?" I like, yep. I like I like I like the way you phrase that. Yeah. So I, I think unfortunately a lot of people that I work in work with will you know come into my office and say I have all of the things that people who should be happy have, and totally. I'm not happy. Mm-hmm. Which is a really interesting exploration because if those things don't necessarily lead to happiness, and you decouple having those things from happiness, what it also mm-hmm. implies is that if you have nothing you can actually be happy. Right, exactly, exactly. So let's try to understand where your, I'm trying to think about the word, how did you get to be in a situation where you were grateful and engage in the flow state? How did that happen for you? Where I was grateful, or when I was engaged in the in the flow. All of the, state. How did you get to where you are, Lyle? Um, how did I get to where so, I am? Well, let me try. To, so I've noticed that sometimes when I ask you a question, maybe it's like kind yeah. of too broad. Sure. Do you think? Do you think it would be good if I ask a broad question and kind of give you some time to think through it, or would it be more helpful if I kind of teed you up a little bit more? Let's try. Let's try what you two me up a little bit more looks like. So here's what I'm envisioning. There's Lyle Drescher. Yes. Six year old kid growing up in a Jewish neighborhood, presumably Jewish, going yes. to a Hebrew school. Incompatible parents. Parents get divorced. You're not really in the flow state then. Parents remarry and stuff. There's no real trauma or anything like that. Or, you know, nothing juicy. For like a psychologist or therapist or anything like that. And then you're like, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm in fifth grade. I'm a make cool stuff on the internet. And so you started yeah. making cool stuff on the internet. You got like six mm-hmm. views. And then yeah. I, I don't know if, if you were happy then or not. And then you're like, I'm going to go to stand up at the age of 16, which if you want to talk about having a pair of balls and being brave, like, you know, going to punk clubs at the age of 16 and doing stand up and unclear whether people are laughing or not laughing, like, you know, you kind of say, you guys go do your intramural stuff, but I'm going to go do the cool thing. Whereas the other sure. way to look at it is like, you guys participate in society and I'm going to be over here being an outcast, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I oh, yeah. something tells me that when you were 16 years old, you were not the cool kid, even though you described doing the cool things. I felt as though I didn't feel like I was like actively uncool, but I did feel like, uh, I had carved, you know, my friends and I had carved our own sort of like if if you think of a a traditional, you know, buy it cool kids and not cool kids like that spectra. I felt like as though we carved our own 
sort of lateral sort of thing. Lateral. Yeah. Yes, we were lateral. Yeah. And so were you happy then? And then I'm not quite sure how old you are. It sounds like you're maybe like 23 or something. Ball yes, I'm, I'm exactly 23. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and then about a year and a half ago, unclear whether you went to college or, you know, what happened or whether you were supporting yourself. And you kind of start doing this side thing a couple of years ago on Instagram, on Reddit Public Access Network, on TikTok and Twitch. And now when we hear you talk about stuff, it's sort of like, I'm grateful for what I have and I yeah. enjoy feeling alive. Yes. And so how, where did, when did you start to feel that way? How did you get there, man? That's I, what teeing up looks like, by the way. I don't, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, you asked this. Yes, there we go. Okay, you asked the same question, but you teed me up for it. Perfect. Uh, I don't know if there is... I don't, I don't know if there is a there. Right? Like, is, 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 isn't that a thing? Like, is there a there? You know, of course there's not, like, a, a there. But, like, um... I've had, uh, but it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like it's the same, the feeling that I have. I had it when I was 16, when I was in the rock club about to get on stage at one o'clock in the morning when I had school tomorrow, where I think to myself, I'm like, this is cool, you know? And then there's a feeling that I have when I'm like, you know, a, an internet gecko guy and, you know, I'm Twitch streaming for a living where I'm like, this is cool, you know? Um... But I don't know if it's a if it's a there or anything like that, um, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, so I, I think Lyle, I think you're doing it right because the more that you talk, the less sense you make, and the more you sound like a Zen master. So you know, is there a there is a very Zen <laughs> master kind of statement, right? Because sure. if you look at Zen Buddhism, they'll say like weird things like that. There is no sure. there. There is only here, and it's like. <laughs> What's that even mean? Yeah, yeah. But so help us understand what do you mean by like, is there really a there? There is no there. What does that mean, man? Does it make any fucking sense? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Is there a there? Like, like, there is never a time in which, like, you know, you are completely, you, you, you have unlocked. I mean, that would, I don't even know what the fuck that would look. I think that I genuinely think that looks like death. Like, if you. Like, you've unlocked everything, you are supremely happy, you're in post-game, new game plus, whatever, you know? Uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know if, what that even looks like. I think that there's just, like, people, I think the way to combat that is just to really love the process and the, 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 the journey toward the thing, you know? Yeah, but what if the journey sucks? Like what happened? Uh, like, so, do do you have any memories of of going to the rock club when you were sixteen? Like specific memories? Yeah. Like, can you tell us? Like, paint us a picture of like, you know, like what you remember? Like, if if you have kind of memories. Yeah, of I mean, yeah, I would like show up and park my car in somewhere where I was just hoping I wasn't going to get a ticket, and then I would come into the thing, and I was younger than everyone else, so I like, I mean, everyone else was like, you know late 20s like like mid to late 20s or or sometimes early 20s which i guess looked like mid to late what i look at now if that makes sense yeah um and so like i was afraid i didn't i just kind of didn't talk to anyone you know and i was really and a few like people would come up and talk to me i was really grateful for those people because i was too young. i wasn't gonna like make the first like hey what's yeah. up man kind of thing you know um so I really remembered everyone who came up and like would talk to me, uh, but I I was, I was being like I was like nervous. I just wouldn't like talk to anyone. I just really wanted to like wait, sit, watch. But comedians they don't like to watch each other. They like stand in the back, but I but I didn't know anyone. I, I didn't have anyone to stand in the back with, so I would I would just sit and watch, and um, uh, and just kind of wait my turn. I remember actually no, this was the very second time. This was when I went to the rock club. It was the very second time. I did stand up. I remember being, no, I remember being in the, I went to the bathroom and it was like a punk bathroom and all these stickers. And I was like really nervous. I was just nervous to be there, like to walk into the room, like while I was 16, like in front of all these people who were, were you know, older than me. And uh, I remember I had just read this book by this guy named Chris Gethard. 
And in the book, he talks about um, how he like well he he likes going out of his way to um, <coughs> put himself in situations that are uncomfortable just for the just I, I I don't know I remember reading that when I was sixteen and that spoke to me so I was in the bathroom thinking about that and being like all right I'm gonna embrace that and I've actually that sort of started a a a, a thing of like embracing being in uncomfortable situations um so i remember you know, i was in the bathroom and i was like okay well, i'm not gonna leave i'm gonna stay and i'm gonna do my set and it's gonna be uncomfortable but i think it's cool that i'm really uncomfortable right now you know i could have like i said i could have i could have played soccer and what was it like when you did your set it was the second time so that was the second time i did stand up the first time i did really well and then this is what happens is you do really well. And then you, the second time you do the same like jokes or whatever, and they don't do as well. And, uh, but it, it didn't jar me that much. One of the cool things about like going to open mics and stuff is like, everyone thinks that stand up is so like life, like life or death. Like I can't feel like, Oh my God, I can't fathom the idea of like being up in front of people and like trying to be funny and it not working. But then you go and you do it and you're like, Oh, it's not, it's, it's, it's part of the thing. It's not that bad. And you see other people fail and, and you know, so it, it wasn't that bad. It was kind of, it was fun. Um, you know, I had a couple things go over well, and I, I talked to a few people, and uh, I came home. I felt cool, and uh, and yeah. Even and though the I, se second set didn't what, go well? Help me understand. Yeah, that. no, I still, I still felt cool. I felt cool for having done it, you know. I, I wouldn't say it didn't go well. I, said, I, I think um, it went okay, you know. Um, I I wouldn't say like like I like I would rate it a you know a six out of ten maybe, um, but I, I liked uh, I liked I liked the scene I liked going there and I liked being somewhere weird at a weird time as a sixteen year old you know I liked that so I, I didn't really care how the set went if I got to you know do that so it felt cool. So once again, I'm kind of getting the sense of like carving out, right? Like you're going to follow, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just did a, help me understand that. What, what happened? What is, what is carve, what does carving out mean? I, you're the one who used the words. I am. Yeah. So you were so, 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 carving out and forget that I said that. Uh, don't worry about it. Oh, oh, like, oh, 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 yes. Carving the, pe oh, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, so, yes, but, yes. but something about when I use the words just now to describe your comedy experience, it seemed like it hit a nerve, right? Like, oh, because oh, I, I, because I didn't realize what you were, uh, oh, oh, okay, okay. Talking it was just about, but now I do. Oh, yes. The yeah. carving, yes, yes. And that's, um, you know, that's, I think that's kind of been a big part of, uh, my, like, a, a, in, in a way, approach to life, you know? Is uh, I've always wanted to, you know, try to carve out my own thing, you know, and uh, that's that's been a big goal of mine for a while, and and that's why I'm I'm really grateful I get to do this weird gecko talk show thing because it it, it feels like I'm able to carve out my own, uh, you know, sort of path in in life. Oh, absolutely! I think I think you literally wear carving out your life on your sleeve. <laughs> right that's awesome like i mean yeah. literally like you you put on a fucking costume yes to show people that you're not going to play intramural whatever <laughs> right <laughs> you're yes. not going to look you're not going to look human yes yes you're goddamn right dr k <laughs> and uh because <clears throat> i'm noticing like that's absolutely a theme right like it's sort of like sure. what i'm what i'm hearing is that within you there is a voice that has said, don't do as others do, do this other thing. Like, and not so much yeah. that there's anything wrong with what other people do, but really like listen to what that internal voice is. Cause I don't know many people who at the age of 16 were going to comedy clubs and doing stand up. I know sure. a lot of 16 year olds who had dreams of doing stand up. I know sure. a lot of 16 year olds who wanted to be stand up comedians and have like a Netflix special or HBO special or things like that. I know a lot of 16 year olds who thought they were very funny and could do stand up certainly knew a lot of 16 year olds who thought they were as funny as the people who were actually doing stand up. 
Sure. But I didn't know many people who actually did stand up. Well, now if you're a 16 year old and you think you're funny, you don't even ha- you don't even have to go to the rock club downtown. You just whip out your phone mm-hmm. and make a TikTok. And granted, yeah. I was sort of doing that same sort of thing, but uh, you know. So there's another thing that I kind of want to just touch on for a second, which is just really totally. me sharing an opinion. Um, I don't know that I have a whole lot of questions for you, but you, you know, feel free to respond. But like. So I think a lot of times when people look at success, what they really look at is like people will say like, oh, the guy put on a gecko costume and like blew up on TikTok and that's why he's successful. Right. They'll say sort of say things like right place, right time, kind of like the stars aligned and and like, you know, that's how you became successful. But I think for most people that I've worked with who are very successful, what I almost always find is a story actually a lot like yours. Whereas like, you know, the therapy gecko is not the first step in a journey. Like you started making Mm. content on the internet at the age of what sounds like 10 or 11. And so you've been thinking on it, working on it. You literally went to stand up comedy clubs at the age of 16 Mm. and you've Mm. been practicing creating content and being funny in the somewhat intentional way ever since your brain was like very, very young and like literally wiring. And then it's not surprising at all, but what I tend to find, I'll see this also in like, you know, some of the startup founders that I work with that like very few of them are successful with their first company. Like what happens is they're like in, when they were eight, they started a lemonade stand. And then when they were 14, they like started this hustle at school where they were like selling candy bars. Yeah. Like one guy that I worked with, like they, you know, the school stopped having a Coke machine or something. So they were like selling Cokes like behind the cafeteria and and shit like that. And then like, you know, they went on to be like, yeah, black market Cokes. Um, And and so I I think I just wanted to kind of comment because I think a lot of people in our community are sort of trying to figure out like, how do I be successful? Yeah. Or they'll sort of try to, you know, ask themselves, hey, I'm like trying to work on this stuff, but it doesn't seem to be working and I don't know what to do next. And I sure. think it's just important to highlight that, like, you, you know, you've been working at this for probably over a decade in some yeah. way, shape or form. And sure. so the therapy gecko that people see is not just a random guy putting on like a, a gecko costume. It's sure. like actually like, you know, when you speak and you wind up being relatively funny that there's like you know, a lot of like internal psychological work that you've done sitting in a bathroom and sort of like, you know, dealing with your nervousness and then getting up there and trying to be funny, being okay with a six out of 10 and then showing up the next week and doing it again and like practicing and working on your, your craft. Um, Mm -hmm. it was just something that I I noticed hearing your story and just wanted to kind of point it out. What do you think? Oh yeah. I know. I I appreciate that. Um, it's funny. I, I've, uh, I've like sort of thought about that um, you know, I, uh, uh, the, the, the therapy gecko is very new, but I, 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 like, I, I, yeah, this is sort of a random thing I was, like, thinking about in my head, and I was, like, you know, trying to give myself credit, because I was, like, you know, the therapy gecko is very new, but, like, the, I, a lot of the sort of roots of it are, are, it, are not, you know, like, I've, I've been trying to, you know, as I said, sort of carve out my own path you know, for, for a really long time and, uh, you know, trying to do silly things on the computer for a very long time. So like, even though like streaming and being a lizard are kind of new, I think the stuff behind it is, is, is kind of not. Yeah. So interesting. So, okay. Um, and what do you think it is that helps you get into that flow state? You need me to tee you up um, for that? Sure. I'm, I, I'd love to hear the tee up. I don't have one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, fuck it. Oh, no, I, that, that I think I could, that question okay. I think I could answer. Um, <laughs> um, um, God, I fun. love this thing, the tee up. Uh, well, okay. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I was doing before, like I was doing this was like, trying to like write jokes or write uh sketch and like that that's like right like sitting down and writing getting into the flow state is so hard 
Like, I respect the fuck out of people who can, like, sit and write essays or write sonnet, whatever the hell you're writing. Like, uh, you know, I respect the fuck out of people who can do that because it's... There's, there's infinite, like... Cause just like I'm in the flow state with the, uh, you right now. I really felt like you know we're having a conversation. I can't stop our conversation to like go look at YouTube, or like go eat a snack, or you know go do this or the, like like there's no, I like I'm 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 in this. I'm talking to you. We're doing this right now. We're live. There's no room for me to get distracted or anything. Whereas like if you're trying to like write something or edit a video or make a song or something like that you know there's no thing that's like i don't, I don't know if i'm going to use the phrase holding accountable because i don't really feel like i'm being like held accountable but like you know it's 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 much so so when i stream and like you know i talk to people you know it's easier for me to get into the flow state because like a conversation is developing naturally and it's just it just is a much more natural thing to do than like you know, sit down and put pen to paper. So, you know, I'd, I'd been, I, so I, so that's why I like it. I like it a lot as a, as a, as a medium of, of doing things on the internet and creating that's, in a sense. I'm with you. So Lyle, now I'm going to ask you a question, which yeah. I'm going to try to answer after I ask you, but I'm going to yeah. ask you, okay. What, what would you say are the features of the flow state? What makes the flow state different from the non-flow state? Um, you're doing more than you're thinking about what you're doing. And you're not so criti critical of yourself and analyzing yourself. You know, like, if I'm really in the flow state, I'm not... Like, like if we're, like, when we're, like, like you know, at, at the highest points of, like, flow, I would say, like, in our conversation, I'm not thinking about, like, oh, how's chat reacting to this? Or, like, how is this coming off? Or anything. I'm just talking, you mm -hmm. know. And that's how I feel like when I do my own stream is like, you know, I'm not. I'm really not thinking about anything else except for, you know, the person I'm talking to. But I guess to answer the question more, like the the, the traits of the flow state. So I guess a maybe a lack of a, a loss of ego. I don't know. I'm not gonna start pretending like I know anything about spiritual stuff. But uh, oh, you know a lot about spiritual stuff, Lyle. <laughs> Uh, so why maybe, why do you say loss of ego? What does that mean? See, uh, this is why I didn't want to say because then you were going to ask me what it means, and I was yep. I I don't know if I can explain it as well. I guess like uh, well I guess like what it means to me is like you know, like I said, like if if if, if I'm not thinking about how I'm coming off, I have the free like like that's a crutch. Like thinking about what other people think about you is like a fucking crutch, and it'll prevent you from speaking. Freely, because you're like, oh no, that sounded stupid. That sounds you're just, you're speaking freely, um, and so I think that that freedom from self criticism as you're speaking or or as you're writing or painting or doing you know whatever you'd be doing is is an integral part of the the flow state. It sounded like a pretty good answer to me about what loss of ego is, right? So Thick. what I'm hearing is that. There are times where you think about yourself mm -hmm. as it relates to an activity. If I'm writing, am I a good writer? Is this good yeah. writing? And then there are yeah. times where you are removed from the equation and there is just yeah. the writing. Yeah. So it's kind Absolutely. of interesting because even if we go back to the beginning of the interview, there were times where your ego was present. Like, totally. oh, is Dr. K going to be pissed if I show up? See, then sure. you're thinking about how other people will respond to you, and now you don't care yeah. what I think. You're not even thinking about what I think. Sure. You're just having the conversation. And so what we've actually sure. done is somehow we've managed to remove ego from the equation, mm -hmm. right? And as we remove you, as you're no longer concerned about, oh, am I supposed to be talking about problems? Am I supposed to be doing this? So I think supposed to is another good word that sort of shatters the of flow state. Um. But I, I think you, you know this stuff, and, and that's why I, I don't feel like I have to tee you up for it. And I think the only thing is you don't know that you know it, or you, have, you, have a, you don't have faith that you can explain it. But it's pretty clear to me. And what I'm going to do at the end, and maybe the end is you know, whenever we can 
do it now if you want to. It doesn't have to be the end. But what I'm going to do is actually go through a list of statements that you've made and kind of tie them together to like old spiritual texts on meditation, spiritual growth and enlightenment. Because you do say a, a lot of remarkable stuff that like overlaps with what those folks say. Sure, that's uh, you know what's funny is like I when you're I'm always like had this uh, thing of like you know waiting like uh, oh god you know no 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 say say the thing first and then I'll and I'll say no, my, go, go for it I'm right, now I'm curious you I guess can, like uh like if I had like a, like if I had a thought like like if you have a thought you're almost like waiting for it to get like like. You're, you're sort of waiting for it to get validated for other people to like be something that makes sense. Um, and like, I think everyone has that. I've been active and like, and like, I definitely have that. I've, I've tried to fight against that. So you saying that like, I've said something that, oh, another guy said that wrote a book that was saying that thing. I'm like, oh, okay. So I was onto something there when I thought that thing, that wasn't just a crazy thing that I thought. No. Yeah. No, I think you're onto a lot. So this is what I think is really, I guess we can do it now. Um, cause I, yeah. right. so the first thing that I want to kind of share is that like, when you look at old texts on spirituality, um, sometimes people will sort of talk about philosophy or like argument or logic and say like, this is not like, lo like, you know, you can't, what is ego death? And they'll like, try to understand it on an intellectual or logical level. So like, what does it mean to lose your ego? You know, the loss of ego. But the really interesting thing about these, the, at least the spiritual traditions that, that I tend to place a lot of emphasis in, that I've studied, that I propagate in some sense, um, are sort of like the Hindu and Buddhist traditions. And, and what I actually really like about them is that I think they're, they have a very scientific attitude. So they don't say that this is logically correct, and they don't say that you should believe this. They say that if you go and explore and try to figure out how this stuff works— when we tried to figure out how this stuff works, here are the conclusions we came to. And we suspect because then we had a bunch of other people go and investigate it on their own. And this is consistently what people come up with. And so what I really love about this is like literally today, Lyle, you have made statement after statement after statement that I have read in texts that are 600 years old, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old, or 4,000 years old. And I pointed out one, which is like, I asked you, how do you get there? And your fucking answer is like, it's like classic Zen. There is no there. Sure. Yeah. Right. And no one knows what the hell that means, but like you understand it. It like doesn't translate into like logical words. We can try to do a slightly better job there because there is a, there's, you know, practice that can be done in explaining some of these weird concepts. But there's sort of like, anyway, so let's kind of start from the top. So the first thing that I actually want to point out is so i think how you got to where you are okay so <clears throat> we've already talked a little bit about success and how like i actually think that i'm not surprised that you blew up because i think you've actually dedicated yourself to like a craft for some time and if you think about you know your cognitive development and the way that your neurons have wired like you are somewhat of a professional when it comes to whatever whatever it is that we see like, this is not sure. just a random happenstance, right? You've been creating content sure. since yeah. you were 10. You did stand-up sure. comedy. Like, I was stunned to hear both of those things, but now it's sort of making sense for me. And sure. then you you also have, like, you know, you've experimented with different kind of platforms and stuff like that and found a nice combination of what sounds like live streaming on Twitch, which brings out the flow state. So you're also yeah. doing a couple of really cool things that I'll try to help creative people do. What are the circumstances that naturally bring, bring out the flow state? Because when you bring out the flow state, you're going to create the best content. And then you're sort of pairing up Twitch to get that live interaction to set yourself up to bring out the flow state. And then you kind of clip that shit for TikTok because you can't sit down and make a TikTok. Yes. Some people yes. can sit down and script a mm -hmm. TikTok, but you cannot. You've got to mm -hmm. farm TikTok moments on Twitch. Yes, right. I this is I this is like I've been waiting my I almost feel like I've been waiting forever to figure this out. And it's something I try to like tell people who are having like trouble creating things is like I like I exactly what you said. I can't sit down and like write a TikTok, but like what the the way in which I edit like t the Twitch and streaming allows me to just get the fucking raw <laughs> thoughts through of whatever it is I'm thinking or or feeling. And then when I go in to edit it, I actually I have like it's it's there, and I just have to chop it away and like find it, you know. And that's like 
s such a better creative process than sitting and writing, you know? So can I, share... I, I didn't discover that until recently. Yeah. So can I share a couple of thoughts on that? So I've worked with sure. a lot of people who sort of experience things that way. So I think part of the problem mm -hmm. with when we think about how to become successful is sure. that we're given a script, right? So there are some people who have become very, very successful. And then we'll look at them and we'll say like, you know, you can look at successful authors like, you know, let's say like someone like Brandon Sanderson, who, who will say like, you know, sit down and like write every day. What you've got to do is like write every day. And then if you yeah. read other people like Stephen King, apparently like early on, you know, he would use a lot of drugs and, and just write very like a ton of stuff. So different people have different creative processes. So there are a couple of things that I want to kind of highlight about yours, because I think a lot of people can become successful without forcing themselves into a cognitive temperament that does not suit them. So a lot yes. of the work that I, I do is about helping people understand, okay, what, what's your cognitive temperament and how can we set your brain up for success? So some people are the methodical route. Like I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write every day for six hours and you got to just sit down and just like do it. And then some people, I think this is really important. So a big part of the flow state, like we said, is separating the ego from the action. And with some authors that I've worked with, what they struggle with is there's the author and then there's the editor. There's like, you know, the person, there's the creative and then there's the judge. And if both of those are coexisting in your mind, if you sit down and you try to write and the editor is there criticizing the sentence that comes out, you will be paralyzed in front of the page. You will never yep. get a single sentence out. You mm -hmm. have to let yourself write crap. You have to separate out almost like left brain, right brain. It's not really neuroscientifically based, but it's a concept that people understand. You know, you have to set out the, uh, separate out the creative part of you from the judging or editing part of you. And what yeah. I hear you kind of say is like in the editing process, what you do is you vomit out gold and trash on Twitch. And sure. then you can let the editor step in and sort of sift things apart. But if you try to filter or create gold to begin with, you will never succeed. Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Yeah, that's that's why. Dude, that's, that's almost like probably a big kind of I, I was doing that for a while like when i was like you know doing stand-up and making videos and stuff and like i was able to like get stuff out but um fuck i hate i hated that process of like <laughs> sitting down to i never got into the flow state of it you know and it's 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 tough that's that's probably a big reason why I like you know i like to do twitch stuff instead of that yeah so let's talk a little bit about the flow state so i think there are a couple yes. of very important psychological things that you have done which have really set you up for success and these are things that i want to highlight sure. so you remember how your memory sucks yes. you don't remember anything yes do you i'm going to ask you kind of a weird question so there's sure. been really only one time during our conversation where you have given mm -hmm. us an incredibly vivid and lively picture of a past memory from your life do you remember sure. what do you you remember what it was? Yeah, it, it was the uh, I was being at the rock club. Absolutely right. So this is like yeah. how memory works because I think that was a transformative moment for you because what yes. you did in the bathroom was embrace discomfort, right? Yeah. That's that's those are the words that you used. So this is like when the yogis are saying acceptance, like that is literally what acceptance looks like. It's a sixteen year old remembering a book they read, sitting there with butterflies in their stomach feeling out of place in a fucking bathroom about to vomit and saying, you yeah. know what? Let's go. Yeah. Let's go, bitches. Because yeah. you can retreat yeah. in that moment or you can embrace that discomfort. And so the yogis yeah. say that like, you shouldn't try to push away negative emotions. You need to accept your negative emotions, right? Like that's what literally what acceptance looks like. And once mm -hmm. you begin to accept that and embrace that, there's a, there's a very common problem here is that if people think, Oh, if I accept my negativity, doesn't that do me? Like if I accept that I feel ashamed about myself, does that mean that I'm like never going to be confident, right? Because if I accept my shame, does that mean that like I'm not going to be confident? But something funny happens. It's kind of like paradoxical that when you accept the negative things, when you embrace that discomfort, what happens when you go on stage? You, you don't feel as uncomfortable. It's bizarre, right? Yeah, so somehow yeah. by embracing, and so you've stumbled upon, you know, a, a ton of these, like, I'm telling you, like 2000 year old, like, like, you know, 
wise thing. So that like embracing that discomfort and really saying, hey, this is where I am. Like this is, I want to carve this out. This is what I want to do. I don't want to play intramural soccer. I want to be here and and it's okay to be uncomfortable because this aligns with like the life that I want to live. And when you embrace, I think that was a really transformative moment for you. And I think it's like that yeah. acceptance, which has been, and, and there's a reason why your brain remembers it, right? So the reason that you have a vivid memory, the reason you don't remember anything about your divorce is because it doesn't mean anything to you. It's like, there's nothing there. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So like yeah. what you do remember are the important transformative moments of your life. And like, I think that was a mm -hmm. big one where you learned how to accept like negativity. And so mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we talk a little bit about getting into the flow state, I think, you know, embracing the negative is a big part of the flow state because in the flow state you've used the phrase natural so how do you get into the flow state as long as you have internal conflict and we can kind of hear this in a lot of what you've said the first is if you're editing the thoughts in your head right no flow state that's internal conflict if you have negative feelings that you're trying to suppress or push away internal conflict you're not going to get a flow state so a big part of the flow state is to be, as you put it, natural. What does that mean to be natural? I would argue that feeling natural is not having an internal conflict. So if I'm laying out on the beach and not thinking about anything and I feel completely natural and I'm alive and in the moment, there's no conflict. If I'm sitting there in my head thinking about, oh my God, I'm here on the beach and I have so many bills to pay, it's going to create yeah. internal conflict and I'm not even going to enjoy being on the beach. Okay. So I think it's really like that, that moment that you had there was like a real, like, you know, turning point in a, in a movie about success kind of thing. It's like when people play the yeah. triumphant music and, and then you go out on stage. Um, and then I think there's another really interesting thing there, which is if you talk about the way that you respond to, to, how people responded to you. So the first set you did, you had, sounds like not really a whole lot of expectations. So you were pleasantly surprised, or maybe you thought you'd suck. You just went up there and people like you, you kind of even remember, like, it's so interesting that you remember what your first set was like, what the reception was like, what the second set was like, what the reception was like. First one went really well. And then second one, it's really interesting because if you pay attention, it's beautiful the way that your cognition works because you say, it didn't go as well, or you said something like it went bad. And then you actually rewind it a little bit and you were like, actually, it was about the same. It didn't go that much worse. Yeah. It was like a six out yeah, of 10. Yeah. So if we look yeah. at those two statements, what happens is probably when you went up there the second time, you had an expectation. Hey, I'm fine. Yeah. It's going to go great. And it did not yeah. go that great. And then you yeah. felt emotionally like, oh my God, this is going so much worse. And now when you think about that memory in the past, the first answer that comes out is that emotional, oh crap, people aren't laughing as much. But then as you start to think about it a little bit more calmly, a little bit more intellectually, actually it wasn't that big of a difference. You know, yeah. it's just that comparison that you made to the first time. And I think it's not surprising because if you want to get into the flow state, you can't compare. You can't think about how the last stream went. You can't expect mm -hmm. anything. You can't be like, oh my God, do I have problems? Like, oh my God, I don't have problems. Now, what yeah. am I going to do if I'm talking to Dr. K? If that is the thought yeah. in your head, this conversation will never happen. Yep. You got to go with the flow, right? Go so I, I think that, that this too, like in that, in that moment, I think it was a really good like instance of when you have an experience, if you create an expectation about the next experience, it will actually make it very hard for you to enter this flow state or impossible actually. Because the flow state is a one-pointedness of the mind. And if you are trying to fulfill an expectation, your mind is not fully in the task because a small amount of your RAM is being spent comparing to like the last time. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Am I there yet? And this is kind of really interesting because when I teach people meditation, their first like spiritual, trippy, psychedelic experience is actually easy to get. So when I teach people certain kinds of meditation, they'll have these like weird spiritual experiences where they'll be like, oh my God, it was bizarre. I felt connected to the universe. I realized whatever, or they like have memories from their past life where like weird stuff starts to happen. And then the first one is like super easy because they have no idea it's coming. So they can enter the flow state in meditation. They can attain one pointedness of the mind. And then like something weird happens in their consciousness. The second time is the hardest. 
Because once it happens the first time, you sit down to meditate and you're like, can't wait. Let's go. Let's feel connected to the universe. And then like, it doesn't happen. Why am I not feeling connected? Oh my God. Oh my God. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. So you create that kind of expectation and then it kind of like shatters the flow state. And then kind of the third thing that I wanted to say is we talked about loss of ego, one pointedness, not being critical, right? So as long as you're being critical of yourself, it's going to create that tension, shatter the flow state. And the last thing that I kind of want to say about the flow state is like the words that you use to describe it. So we talked about channeling, right? Like you're channeling the therapy gecko. And on days that you try to be the therapy gecko, I would suspect it's harder to be the therapy gecko. Hmm. Actually, it's this sort of weird thing where, like, uh, it's funny you say that because uh, sometimes uh, uh, I I do have like a like like I like to channel the therapy girl, and sometimes I feel like if I'm not making a uh, intentional decision to to act in a certain way, it doesn't happen, and then I and then I look back and I'm like, oh, I was I didn't I didn't like. I didn't do that stream in the way that I I wanted to. I was too like this way. Maybe like I laughed too much when like you know I I I would have rather been you know sort of more more stoic or something like that. So Lyle, um, there's a huge difference. I completely agree with you. Yeah. But there's a huge difference between intention and expectation. Sure. Right. So I think that when we talk about the flow state, there must absolutely be complete intention one pointed intention all of your intention is to be something and this is where things like even my language is going to start to fall apart but like intention and expectation are two different things because intention is about what you're putting into it expectation is about what you hope to get out of it yes yeah yeah right Mm -hmm. so i think there i think when you try too hard to be the therapy gecko you will not actually be the therapy gecko what I would say is when you let yourself become the therapy gecko, you will be the best therapy gecko. You have to let it take you for a ride. You can't, you know, turn on the engine and just go and tell it where to go. Yeah. You got to let it take yeah. you. Mm. What do you think about that? I, I, I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Letting... That's this that that is that's fun. That is, that is like meditation, where like if you sit down and you're like, I'm going to become the one with the world or whatever. It doesn't work, but if you sort of let it happen, I'm trying to I'm trying to like I'm thinking about like uh, like I'm thinking about like last night's stream, like because I I felt like I I was very much in the flow state and acting, presenting myself in the way that um you know I I wanted to you know um <clears throat> and yeah I I I would say that's pretty accurate. So I, I, and I think even if you go back to the early part of our stream today and you talk about, you know, what, what it's like when I use the word channel and you started using these words, like you were being and alive, you know, like maybe that was my word, but the way you were kind of describing it is like, you know, there's sometimes the, you, you know, some of the yogis and Zen masters and stuff will describe it as a flowering so the reason I, I, I think they use the word flowering is because you can't like make a flower bloom. You know, yeah. like you can't like if there's a bud, like you can't peel it apart and like turn it into a flower. It's something that you have to let happen. Right. So it's not something you can do, but it's something you have to let happen. And this is a, this is a concept that I think is very, very like lost in our society today because we're all about like metrics and performance and like living up to expectations and having job descriptions and like you know, you know, what's your KPI? Like how many views are you getting? How many subs are you getting? We're all like outcome oriented. So we don't, we've forgotten sort of as a society, how to let things bloom, right? How to set everything up, how to, you know, start making content on the internet at 10, but you didn't care about your views and stuff. I mean, maybe you did, but you're focused on making content and doing stand up, And then like, as all of these factors kind of go together, as you water the plant, as you give it sunlight, is you give it the right kind of soil and fertilizer, eventually something grows and it takes a decade and then you see a flowering. It's a happening. And so what I, I, I'd kind of say is that when you talk about the flow state, this is sort of the last concept that I'll share, is there's this idea in, in yoga and in meditation that we each have within us a piece of divinity. And that gets kind of confusing because people are like, what the f- does that mean? Like, does that mean I can move mountain? What does that mean? 
People don't know what divinity is. And so I'd say like, instead of trying to understand divinity from kind of like a, ab like a logical way or abstract way, there is something within you that once you channel it, like everything is just good, baby. It's like you feel alive, you produce better content, you feel happier, right? It's not like an abstract because you've got the chair. It's like a, it's like an experience of happiness. And it's not even like happiness like you're laughing. It's not even emotional, right? Because that's the other thing that confuses people about the word happiness is they correlate happiness with positive emotion. But in the flow state, what it really is, is when you're channeling that divinity, that's when you produce work, right? So like, I think it was the Greeks that talked about genius is something that like strikes you, right? So it's like this thing that is not something you aren't a genius, you channel genius. And yeah. so genius yeah. is like a state of mind as opposed to a person. And so this state of flow, like makes you feel happy, makes you feel alive, not on an emotional level, not now I've got my big chair level, but in that moment, you feel present. You're not thinking about the future. You're not thinking about where things are going. You're not thinking about metrics. You're not worried about whether you're doing a good job or bad job. And so what I really call that, I think like you've got a taste of that, which is like what they just, they use the word divinity because they couldn't come up with what that is. Right. So they said that, mm -hmm. oh, each, each of us has the spark of the divine, because if you look in you look in that moment, you're OP, right? You're performing well, you're happier, you're like doing a fantastic job and that sounds OP. So what we're going to call that is the divine. And then they also went through a series of like different practices and stuff to cultivate that state, to spend more time in that state, to advance beyond that state into other states. And then eventually you get to something that, that they called moksha or enlightenment, which has all of the features of the crap that you've already been describing, like loss of ego and other things like that, which I, I know you said you couldn't explain, but I think you did a very good job of because I think you actually understand it because it sounds like you've lived it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my spiel. Interesting. Uh, so I, I, this, this is making me like uh, what, like when people say that like, uh, you know, God told them to paint a, a picture or something, maybe that's like, that's their interpretation of, that or, or something it's, it makes a lot of sense interesting thing <coughs> there is <coughs> i'm not so sure that that's the case because there's a great book by a guy named uh william james called the varieties of religious experience and some artists mm -hmm. were like mentally ill or possibly psychotic um, uh -huh. or, or or maybe they had a spiritual experience like through prayer it's, it's interesting sure. but what i do sure. find is that that um Especially with like the creative, like people who I, I, I work with who make music and, and write and things like that, that they really have to like, the more they can cultivate that channeling of divinity, the more mm -hmm. they sort of almost accept that I can't control it. Because a big part of like creative folks is that they set themselves up with the expectation of today, I have to write like a blockbuster yeah. piece of music. And if they, yeah. th that expectation will paralyze them. Whereas if they go back, because their first blockbuster came without any expectation of being a blockbuster and they made music for the sake of fucking making music, you know, and that's what made it a blockbuster. And then they try to make a blockbuster and then sometimes they, they succeed because it's procedurally generated, you know, highly processed kind of algorithmically driven stuff. It's like Netflix is just adding a sprinkling of a homosexual sex scene somewhere in all of their shows. You know, so sometimes it's driven like that, but then you have like, you know, the, the real artistry behind certain shows where people are like, they're not trying to make a blockbuster. They're just trying to tell a story or trying to, you know, really make something genuine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That all makes perfect sense. Anyway, I want to just acknowledge that I've been talking most of the time and just check in with you about how you feel about that, like especially over the last half hour or so. Oh, I think I I uh, think that's 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 fine. I uh, I always say um like like I I already know what I think about things, and I know my so I, I don't that's why I don't talk as much, you know, especially on like my uh, stream and stuff. Like I'm like you know I don't I already know what I think about things, you know. I want to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I think what's so I would encourage you to maybe share a little bit more, Lyle, because I, I think you've happened to stumble upon a lot of answers that people are really looking for. Um, sure. And unless I'm, I'm totally misreading you in terms of, you know, where you are, but it sounds to me like you've worked really hard for a long time and it may have yeah. looked like non-traditional, like hard, like it's not like you were sitting there and reading books, right? But you were like fucking going yeah. to comedy clubs at the age of 16 
and having like I see. I appreciate you saying that because I I I uh, you know I, I I I don't read a lot of books, but uh, you know I I do think a lot about things like you know how to be yourself and accept discomfort and all that. And and I'm not like a. You know, it's funny that because you know I I do feel like that was a transformative moment that I had when I was 16 and the rock club and everything and um. And 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 yet weirdly it doesn't like 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 that that the whole thing of like there is no there like you know I didn't at sixteen embrace discomfort and then never feel discomfort ever again like you know I I still have times all the time where I'm like you know uncomfortable and I have to just like think of I I feel like I, I've developed like good concepts for myself of like being yourself and embracing discomfort but they're they're just like concepts that I am like following not so much that i have mastered in any way shape or form they're just like they're they're like they drive me but i i i'm i'm still you know on, on the on the path to getting better hang, handles on them yeah i think that makes a lot of sense so i think part of the reason that you understand so much is because you haven't read a whole lot <laughs> what does that mean exactly what it said so so understanding so in the the yogis sort of realize that there are two kinds of knowledge there's sure. vidya which is information which is objective mm. and which is transmissible and then sure. there's understanding which is subjective not transmissible and in in western society we trend, tend to rate vidya as more than understanding or nyan, which is the other word. It, so it is the, the information one, yep. right? So we tend yeah. to value information over understanding. And I know that sounds sure, kind of yeah. weird, but no, we, we, want, we, want ob we value objectivity over subjectivity. But you can, understanding is by definition like subjective, right? It's not sure, yeah. like it's just how you understand something, right? There has to be a subject for understanding. There does not have to be a subject yeah. for information. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I think what you've managed to do is like a lot of the things that you're cut like you're stumbling upon the same way that they have stumbled upon for like, you know, and they kind of came yeah. to these conclusions like, oh, actually, it's important to accept your negative emotions. It's important to embrace those difficult things. And then there's sort of this idea, I'm glad you shared this, that, you know, all the Vidya folks who hear the story of you and they're like, oh, I need to have my transformational moment in the bathroom and then I'll be good. Then life will be easy. Then I'll live my life with confidence and I'll crush it. And it's like, no, 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 right. you're still going to struggle with discomfort. You just, it doesn't actually make it objectively any better. It makes it subjectively right. better. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's that that uh that like information over understanding thing. I I think it's I think it's really true. Like uh, I don't know. I don't I don't have like as much of a handle of like current events as as, as a lot of people do. Um, and I feel like sort of uh, you know, I guess in the way that the internet works, like everyone's talking about a different thing every five seconds, and it's like, and I don't know. Sometimes I look at that, and I'm like, but there's that's not as interesting to me as like all the problems and bullshit that's you know people have been dealing with for for thousands and thousands of years that I don't really see a whole lot of people, uh, you know, talking about, you know, I don't really talk about like current events or stuff like that on, on, on my stream, but like, I know that that's sort of like a, a big driving thing in, uh, in Twitch and internet culture is like, you know, talking about like, oh, here's what happened like in the news or here's like this YouTuber that's feuding with this YouTuber or something like that. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very anti that. And I'm like, you know, I, I like, I like more sort of like, uh, uh, timeless or or broad uh concepts you know i, I like sure. talking about that more than that kind of stuff i don't know if what i just said is related to anything that we were talking about just now but uh that's how i think about stuff yeah so here's kind of what i heard i heard that sure. um you know you like to focus not so much on like information but on like understanding related stuff right so not like what's yes. going on and just propagating and sharing like oh this is going on here or there that's just kind of like factual sort of objective kind of like stuff um and I, i'm not surprised and what i said what i meant by you know i think it's because you don't have information that you have understanding it's because you don't read yeah. a lot that you understand so much because i think sure. what happens is when people read something they form an idea of it, which can sometimes actually get in the way of understanding. And the best mm -hmm. example I can think of is when people talk about sex. So like, I remember when I was like 13 and my friends and I were like all talking about sex and how amazing it is. And like, 
you know, you'll see like everyone talking about sex in different, you know, communities and stuff. And then like people will form notions of sexuality or virginity or like what it's supposed to be like or whatever. And then when, when you actually start, you know, having sex, like some of those preconceived notions that you may get from watching pornography or having conversations with people is like, can actually get in the way of you understanding and appreciating the experience for what it is. And once you start having sex and you kind of become comfortable with it, and hopefully you have, you know, a partner or more that, that can, you guys can kind of explore things and discover it kind of your own way. Then you have your own understanding of it, which may be like completely yeah. foreign to what you see in the pornos, but like the people in the pornos may have lots of information about it, right? Like they have all this external understanding and oftentimes we see this a lot in spirituality too. Like sometimes I'll get people who are like read a bunch of books on spirituality and they'll say things like, oh, I'm going to like live in the moment. So living in the moment means I get to put my dick wherever I want to when I feel like it. And if, mm -hmm. if my girlfriend has a problem with that, well, that's just her being full of attachment and she needs to be free and like embrace her pain. And because if she embraced her pain and embraced her discomfort, it wouldn't be a problem for her. So like, yeah. I'm going to continue yeah. putting my dick wherever she wants to, wherever I want to. And then if she has a problem with it, I'm living in the moment, I'm living in the present, I'm being happy, I'm being me. And she's the one who's not able to embrace her discomfort. So they'll like take all these concepts and like sort of use them as rationalization or justification to propagate whatever negativity they're propagating. Mm -hmm. And so I think on the other hand, you've just discovered on your own. So like you actually have yeah. sort of a, a, like an untouched understanding of things, which is great. I'm not surprised well, I, that your stream is successful. Well, I appreciate that. It's uh, I, I was talking about this earlier where it's like, you know, when you're talking about the, the, the reading versus the sort of something up onto things on my own, it's like, uh, you know, sometimes I'll have, like think about shit and I'll be like, uh, and, if, and if you don't, if like if you read something, like if something is presented to you within the binds of a book or like it's being said by some, you know, guy on the Internet who has a bunch of followers or, or something, it's like it's 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 very it's you you can accept it as more valid than a thought that you stumble upon on your own. So, you know, it, it it's uh, it, it's difficult to like val like validate your own thoughts, you know as opposed to and your own like thoughts and understandings as opposed to like information that is presented to you even though you know all information is just comes from just some other fucking person who understood it on their own you know accord well i i think if you really tunnel down there there's like a nuance there that's pretty important which is that you keep on using the words information and understanding so mm. information can be validated understanding cannot but mm. right? you can sort of validate it internally but what yeah. that person is actually propagating is information, and you shouldn't compare your, their information to your understanding. Ultimately, I think the, the reason I share information is to yeah. catalyze people's understanding. So, mm -hmm. And nothing I've said today is correct. It's just a framework. Right. So like cool. I, I really appreciated a lot of what you said and I just sort of tied it into things that I've read because I thought it was like it's a really cool example of like, you know, last time I checked, you haven't spent, you know, years studying religious texts. So it's really awesome. And it's actually quite validating for me to hear someone who's not formally trained in any of this stuff start to describe these experiences because that's like, oh, wow, like this is really cool. This person has not been polluted by religious study. And yet sure. they are coming up with these conclusions. So this actually cool. gives me more faith in what I've read because it sounds like you kind of figured this stuff out on your own, which means that it's more likely to be true because anything that's true, someone should be able to figure out on their own. I love that. That's, that's pretty wild. Yeah. I don't know what you were expecting today. And I apologize if I, you know, dominated the conversation. Oh, oh no, oh, I, I expected absolutely nothing. I am um, actually, to be honest, I'm <laughs> like, uh, you know, you know, I, I, <clears throat> when you sort of brought up the fact that, like, oh, we don't have to like go in and like find it. Cause I, I guess I wasn't expecting to like try to find a problem with me, you know, or anything. Cause I, I don't think I have like anything that's sort of glaring. So I'm glad that we've been able to have uh, a, a very great conversation without, uh, you know, having to do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of my teachers once told me that, you know, you should have the conversation in the room that you need to have. Mm. And that's not always a conversation about negative emotions, right? It's like mm -hmm. 
Our purpose here is to educate. And sometimes that education involves the exploration of people's problems. And sometimes like today, I think it involves the exploration of their successes. That's awesome. Any questions for me? I feel like I, I'm kind of, I got out what I wanted, what I felt was appropriate. Um, cool. I don't really have much else to say, but I'm happy to continue talking for a little bit longer if you have thoughts or questions that you want to share. Uh, <clears throat> thoughts or questions that I want to share. Um, I don't know. I guess nothing, 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 nothing strikes to mind off the bat. So is there anything from the chat? I don't know how often you look uh, at chat. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's now's a great time to check in with chat. Sure. I usually try to, once again, to not break the flow state. I try to steer clear of chat while I'm interviewing people. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another thing, too, is like uh, I, I, I don't look at chat when I'm like on the I, – I used to look at chat while I was on the phone with people. And then like the chats – the way that the chat would like make judgments about the person that I'm talking to the phone on would like get into my head. And I hated that because I wanted to form my own you know, relationship with the person on the phone. So I, I stopped doing that. Can the gecko levitate? Can I levitate? Um, um, so <laughs> there's a price for that. So, so there's a little bit of context there, Lyle. Um, and yeah. that context is yesterday we were just talking a little bit about meditation. And there's an old text on meditation that talks about how to levitate. Mm. Um, and so there, it's just, it, it's actually like considered by most scholars to be the most important text like historically about meditation or yoga and and there's an entire chapter in there about developing supernatural powers. Do you know anyone that can levitate? <laughs> um I'm going to decline to answer that question. Um Is that okay? Of course. Okay. Um, so someone's asking, how do you go about getting rid of expectations that prevent the flow state? How do I go about getting rid of expectations that prevent the flow state? I don't know. I, I, I think I've, I've recently, I've, I've tried to make a better, um, go at like recognizing those and just deciding to not give a fuck about them. Like, um... Like, I don't know, so recently, like, you know, uh, uh, like, before I go on a stream, I'll just be like, I, I don't I don't care how many people are watching. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. All I care about, like, I actually sort of have a little, I, you could call it a mental ritual of, like, you know, looking at myself in the mirror and going, all I'm going to focus on is my conversation with the person that I'm talking to on the phone. Um, and not any, like, you know, looking at view or chat or anything like that. Um that's so how I do it with this in this particular case, but uh that's that's a great answer um so i I just to kind of add one or two kind of thoughts onto that one is I think that so if you listen to Lyle, he says he has a ritual, right, so the subtle thing there is that I think this is practiced, so like the more time so the first time may have been in the bathroom when you were sixteen, but yeah what I'm hearing is that you actually have like a cognitive process. That's almost like working out where you're like yes, using yeah. your cognitive muscles to let go of that expectation. Um, yeah. And so I'd say for people who are struggling, like maybe start with, or do you actually look in the mirror? Like, do you literally look in the mirror? Sometimes, sometimes I literally look in the mirror if, if, if there's a mirror. Um, and what do you say to yourself? I just say to myself, like, I don't think, like, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't have like a, like a mantra or anything like that, but I, I just sort of generally think to myself, like, you know, don't worry about views. Don't worry about like, you know, chat or don't worry about chat or like how you're being, don't worry about like anything other than trying to have a, uh, you know, a good conversation. Um, and it is, it is, uh, it's, it's weird getting, tra cause like it's, it's weird getting asked about like how to rid myself of negative expectations for two reasons one is that i totally i i i i never ever ever want to present myself as like an expert on anything because everything that like like getting like you know getting rid of negative expectations like not negative but just getting rid of expectations is something that like i'm 
trying to do. I present it like like that concept I present is like a something that I'm trying to do, not something that I've like mastered or anything like that. Uh, but then too, like uh, what I have, like any any work that I have done on that uh, is very much just like putting in like reps of it. I think. What's wrong with presenting yourself as an expert? What does that mean mm. to present yourself as an expert? Are you presenting yourself as an expert? I don't know. I just like I f this is see this is a sort of a thing that I get into on my stream and maybe now we could talk about like the whole uh thing of um you know, I don't really I know the show is called Therapy Gecko and it is like it's I don't I don't I don't like calling it an advice show for that particular reason that I feel like to have an advice show you inherently have to present yourself as like, I know things. Ask me for advice because I will give you the answer because I know, you know. And I, and I hate doing that. Um, and I guess what's wrong with that? Um, I don't know. It 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 feels like a disingenuous way to present myself. I guess. I think that makes a lot of sense. So I think disingenuously presenting yourself as an expert is probably not a good idea. And at the same time, Lyle, I would encourage you that, you know, if someone asks you a question yeah, that, you know, when you give your answer, you can give it as not an expert or you can give it lateral to the axis of expert, yeah. right? You can just give your answer and let it be what it is and mm -hmm. let them just share what you have to share. You know, maybe that's something, you know, I, I actually kind of like, you know, have a, have a thing with is like, how do I, how do I like, you know, I have all these people like, you know, who will sometimes like call me and ask me for advice. And I'm like, how do I balance the fact that like, maybe, maybe I have an idea of something I want to tell them, but I don't want to present it as the golden answer. But then like, you know, if, I, if I'm going to be like, you know, if people are going to ask me stuff, like I, I should, I should present myself. I should answer things confidently. And not like give up on my thoughts because I, they're not validated. But the same hand, like you know, on on the same thing, it's like I don't, I don't like to feel like I know anything. You know, it's that whole thing of like you know, all I know is that I know nothing and all that. Uh, to no, like no, so, to, so to, I think that's please. a problem. So that's your ego. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So your ego is uncomfortable with the idea of presenting yourself as someone who knows things. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you are neither someone who knows things or someone who doesn't know things. You just are what you are. Yeah. And I, I think you've actually done this really well because I think that I think you. Sh so I would encourage you to just step away from all that crap and just share when people call in, just give them whatever is inside. Right. Mm. Channel that get, like just share whatever you've got down there, because I think there's a reason sure. that people are calling you. And by the way, sure. Lyle, I don't know if you know this, but. Wearing a gecko costume and painting your face green, I think, makes it pretty clear to people that they're talking to someone who's like, they're talking to a, f a guy who dresses up as a fucking gecko. I, I'm not afraid of. I'm not afraid of. I'm not afraid of accidentally present. I'm not afraid of accidentally <laughs> accidentally presenting myself as literally a professional. I think everyone who calls me yeah, like yeah. knows that I'm not like actually a real therapist. No, no, but, but, but it's more like in the. <clears throat> oh, but but what, I, I, th th what I'm saying is like I think you sh you clearly are presenting yourself as just you, so just yes. give them you, and if yeah, if if you, you don't you don't have to offer a disclaimer that I'm not a an expert on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at you, bro. <laughs> right? Like I, I don't. I, I think you go out of your way sure. to make it clear to people that you're just a dude in a gecko costume, which paradoxically. Oh. I think like the more that you embrace that authenticity, the closer to the divinity that you get and don't let yourself mm. edit what you're about to say because of the concern that you could come across as an expert, because that's going to shatter the flow state. So if sure. someone calls yeah. into a show on Twitch where there's a guy who's dress dressed up in a green gecko costume, mm -hmm. I don't think you have to worry about like overselling your qualifications. I think you just give them what they're calling this in for. Because sure. it's good shit. Well, there's kind of another thing of like, and I and I and I I think I've been able to recognize the fact that like you know if people didn't want my whatever on whatever <laughs> they wouldn't have called in. But then there's a thing where like I think 
if if I okay, I feel like if I can give good advice on something, you know, there's this expectation I could give good advice on anything. Like like I like if I have an 18 year old college student call in and go, <laughs> I, how do I make friends in college? I have a I feel like I could actually really like talk with that guy and like give some you know what I what I would feel is good advice. But then if someone calls in and is like. Uh, I'm 38 years old and I, I'm about to be a mother for the first time. Do you have any advice on that? No, I don't. And I want to be comfortable with the ability to be like, yeah, for that specific thing, I I, I try, have nothing to say about that. You know? Um, so we can talk. That? that is that is what I say. Great. Yeah. So I, I think that's beautiful. So I, yeah. I think you could say I'm, I'm a 22, 23-year-old, 22-year-old dude yeah. in a gecko costume. And yeah. unfortunately, I don't know how to advise you about being a 38-year-old mother for the first time. But I'd sure. love to talk yeah. to you for a few minutes, you know? Yeah. And this is where you can yeah. toss out, you know, a question like, what are you afraid of? What are you concerned about? That, that's what I That's what I kind of do if I get into a situation like that is like I'll just Great. ask them questions and not like try to give advice or anything, just sort of. Beautiful. I've been told – um. Sometimes I'll get someone like who's like a real therapist, and this is kind of sort of what happened with this, where it's like someone who's a real therapist would be like, "Hey, you might not know this, but what you're doing is like this thing called motivational interviewing," and then I'll like go and look at that, and I'll be like, "Oh, that's kind of interesting." So I guess that's like what I'll like uh, just you know ask questions instead of trying to give advice or anything like that. Yeah, so I, I think something you know weird has happened if you look at the research on yeah. therapy. So yeah. people will will do studies and they'll look at like different kinds of therapy. So you'll have like different kinds of therapy, like, like very dr mm -hmm. drastically different. You'll have mindfulness based yeah. therapies. You'll have cognitive behavioral therapy. You'll have psychoanalysis. And like those are like very different. One is like worksheets and homework and stuff like that. And the other one is like laying down on the couch where a dude sits behind you and doesn't or a woman sits behind you and doesn't say anything for four hours a week. Right. Those are very different, like worksheets and homework. And so people were kind of curious because if you look at most of the therapies, um, they tend to have comparable outcomes. So if I have depression, and this is sort of an overgeneralization, and I go see a psychoanalyst for four hours a week, or I go see a CBT therapist for one hour a week, it turns out that generally speaking, I get the same amount of better. And so then people got really confused because they're like, which kind of therapy is best? Turns out that they're all comparable. And then people were like, how the hell does that work? Because they're doing such drastically different things. And then what they sort of discovered is that they did something called common factors research. And what they sort of realized is that, like, if you look at what is responsible for the improvement, it isn't a particular modality. It's a set of what they call common factors that are universal to all therapy. So one of those things is, for example, like being a good listener. And so yeah. then the, the really interesting thing is that if you look at some of those common factors of, of, of therapy, what you discover is that there are a lot of other situations where those common factors apply, right? Yeah, so like you yeah. don't have to be a therapist to be a good listener. You sure. don't have to be a therapist to like, you know, answer questions and provide advice and try to help people understand themselves. We have yeah. a lot of different professions and situations. You do it with your friends. Bartenders are famous for doing this stuff, right? Like you go and you talk to your bartender and your bartender is like actually like a trained listener. It's like part of their job. You know, sometimes in religious professions and things like that, you'll get, you know, folks who are like, you know, will offer counsel and advice and will ask like important questions and stuff like that. There's also the field of coaching, which is emerging. And one of the core competencies of coaching is what they call asking powerful questions. And so I'm not surprised that, you know, what you were doing has been described in therapy, but I don't know that that, I mean, I think that long before there was therapy, people were asking questions of each other, questions. Yes, you know, of course. that were like impactful and help people were emo like emotionally supporting themselves, like each other, like yeah. long before there was therapy. And yeah. so now you yeah. have like narrative yeah. therapy and art therapy, like people were fucking painting on in caves for like thousands of years and chances are it was therapeutic. So it's it's sure. kind of like I think you got to be careful when it comes to therapy because I'm not surprised that people are saying, "Hey, you're doing something called motivational interviewing." And like, how did people come up with motivational interviewing? It's because they observed the things that regular humans do that like yeah. seem to help motivate people, and of they course. kind of like figured that out, mm -hmm. and then they codified it and formalized it and figured out where the money is and things like that. 
Uh, but I'm not surprised at all that, you know, <laughs> the, the irony of you calling yourself a therapist and winding up doing something that looks a lot like therapy. But I think that's more just because it's not that it's therapy. It's just that there's a lot of basic human stuff that for some reason therapy has seemed to like claim. Yeah. But I, I think we also see this in things like Alcoholics Anonymous where like, you know, people do a lot of things that inter they do a lot of interventions with each other. They're not trained in therapy, but they do lead to positive clinical outcomes in addiction improvement. And they like emotionally support each other and are there for each other. But that doesn't mean that they're doing therapy. It just means they're being emotionally supportive. But somewhere mm -hmm. along the way, mm -hmm. I think that that definition got kind of muddled. But anyway. It's interesting because one of the big things that I like if, if – um, and again, I don't I, – I, I hate the idea of like centering um, my – like I don't, I don't like referring to it as an advice show. It's more of like a – I'd call it a chat show <laughs> more than advice. But um, – Typically, like if, if someone ever does come to me with like something that I is I feel like is absolutely 100 percent above you know my pay grade, the the question I'll ask them is like, do you have a real therapist and what did they say about this when you told them? And I've always wondered like what like uh, you know how how, how does how does a ther like like sometimes people will come to me with things I'm like I have no idea how the hell to respond to this in any way shape or form, and I'm like what 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 do you learn in like psychology school or whatever that like treat teaches you how to like respond to these things you know so i'd say there are like two things that you learn one is like if you look at the curriculum right so if you look at curriculums for therapy so if you become a like i'm a medical doctor so that the curriculum that i went to was through was like psychiatry which is like the practice of medicine that is focused on pathology relating to the mind, right? So we are, I'm a medical doctor, which means that I treat patients who have something busted. And so a cardiologist will work with people whose heart is messed up. You know, an endocrinologist will work with people like diabetes. A pediatrician will work with children. I will work with people who have trouble with their mind. So we get training in pathology. So we'll get training in like bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. And then people get a little bit confused because remember that sadness and depression and anxiety are all normal human experiences. What do we get trained in? We get trained in the pathological version of those, right? So when anxiety reaches a particular threshold where it in interferes with your ability to function as a human being, then you get diagnosed with a disorder. So we see those people. So that's kind of what our formal training is in, right? So it's like mostly in pathology and stuff like that. Then the other thing that I'd say you learn, which is not necessarily something that you get trained in, but you know, when you become a psychiatrist or a therapist, when you do clinical work, you just get experience sitting with people who are going through really bad shit. Yeah. And, and I think that like, you know, that's not really a formal part of your training. Like, it's not like there's a class for, you know, how to deal with people whose life is just awful. Now you can diagnose with them with trauma or whatever, but like, you know, one of my, um, one of the best nurses that I worked with, she would sometimes, she, so she was an ER nurse and she would, I would ask her, you know, what, what is the patient in room 12? Like what's going on with them? And then she had this acronym SLS, which is shit life syndrome. And you can call it like some kind of, you know, depression or bipolar disorder or whatever. But like, we just sometimes get these kids in the emergency room, like their 17 year old kid has been like in foster care for 12 years, sexually abused at the age of four, you know, just like really terrible stuff, has behavioral problems, has substance use problems, you know, has like, it went to juvie for a year. And like, what's the kid's problem? The kid's problem is that they had a shit life. Like, it's not like they're ill. Like, sure, they have manifestations of illness and they have trouble, like, you know, following rules and, like, they have intermittent explosive kind of problems. But the problem is, like, they've just had, like, they got a really crappy spawn. You know, that's the real problem. If you want to blame something, it's just, like, the circumstances of their fucking life. It's not really their fault. And so the other thing that I think you learn as a clinician is when you, you know, when you work in hospitals for four years and you sit with those kinds of people and you, like, talk to them and you get to know them... It allows you to be able to like handle and sit with things that, as you call it, are above your pay grade. Because you just because what else are you going to do? Like you're the one who's on call. That kid is there. You've got to go in and try to help them. Yeah. And so you just show up and you kind of do the best that you can. And I think a lot of it is really just trial by fire. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I, I'd say that the most important thing that I learned with kids with shit life syndrome is not to be a clinician. It's to be a human. And that's Boy, what they need yeah. more than anything else. Interesting. Like, I like that. <clears throat> and I think that you're fully qualified to do. You can be a human. Sure. 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 Even though you're a gecko. Sure that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's it's uh it's 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 where actually like I feel, I kind of feel that and like uh you know the more that uh I I do this um and I I I I try not to invite people to like um that it's it's you know if it, I I feel like I'm trying to create a space where that you know it's more lighthearted than not uh so but you know um I feel like the more that uh I've gotten a a call that I don't know how to respond to the better I've gotten with dealing with with that um yeah like uh like i did i did a i do like live shows every once in a while i start I, i've been redoing that recently and um i always like had this impression that uh people who you know uh i've started like uh, the first half i'll like take phone calls and i can help bring people up from the audience and when people come up from the audience i had this like expectation that uh the the subject matter that they will want to talk about is a little bit more lighthearted than not and i had this guy come on at one of the live shows who like got really like sort of serious and deep with me about um <coughs> like his his um wife like recently opened up their marriage and uh like he wasn't able to um like you know find other people to have sex with but she was and that was making him insecure and like i, I and and uh he was like really going off and i was not expecting this whatsoever but um weirdly i didn't I, I don't know i didn't feel like nervous or like oh shit what the fuck am i gonna do i just kind of like let him talk uh and sat in that moment um and it and, and i think it ended up turning out okay but uh yeah i don't know i i, I uh I, i'm trying to figure out how to deal with stuff like that when it occurs and i've i've, I've found that i just sort of uh sit in it and let them let them keep talking if i don't have anything to say that's typically what i do if i don't have anything to say is i just let them yeah so i think that that's talking. you know sounds very therapeutic to me doesn't mean that sure. it's therapy right like but sure. i think you know just giving human beings like just being human first and foremost mm -hmm. is what it sounds like like that person just needs you to be human in a gecko costume and then mm -hmm. secondly, you know, if you really want to know how to, you know, help people and, and really want to like, you know, in a sense, get, get better in a particular dimension of what you do, because I think you're quite good and you know how to get better at what you do. You can also, you know, become a therapist if you really feel like it. Right. So like you can go uh, through those, those kinds of, those kinds of trainings and really learn in a guided fashion. I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying like, that's yeah. one of the options. Sure. I, you know, people tell me that all the time and I always, I'm like, I would never want to be a therapist in my entire life. I think that would be, uh, because I don't, you know, th things, things like what I just described, like happen, but, uh, I'd, I'd prefer if they stayed, you know, in the ratio of like 10% or less sure. of the, uh, yeah. overall, I, 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 you know, I like being, you know, like, uh, I like, I, I, I you know, I do Twitch to like, you know, entertain and community and, and stuff, not necessarily, um, I want to do like you know be be a be a therapist True. or anything like that, but uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think that would be that would be hard. I think it would be too hard. I think it makes sense, man. I I think it sounds to me like what you enjoy doing is being an entertainer. Yeah, you like being kind of funny and available to people. But just because you're an entertainer doesn't mean that you can't help people. And as some people said, have said in the past, laughter is the best medicine. For sure. For sure. So I think sometimes you get some heavy stuff. I think that just speaks to the atmosphere that you create and people's comfort in terms of coming on and being able to share that. And like knowing that, I know it sounds kind of weird, but if they, if I can imagine how much courage and shame that person must have been feeling yeah. when they kind of came on. And mm -hmm. also like to know that I'm going to go up and talk to a dude in a gecko costume and no one yep. is going to laugh at me. Yeah. Like that's quite the achievement in terms of the atmosphere you've created. The one, one of the actually probably among the biggest problems that I have with the stream is I'm really is, is, 
is balancing out the the atmosphere in a way because I I I want to like reserve the right to like you know fuck around and like you know not be a jerk to callers but like you know be whatever little gecko character you know but but also reserve like like a very light hard energy but then also like you know reserve all the other stuff and and like really trying to find that balance has actually been pretty sort of difficult i think i can imagine mm -hmm. so i think i think lyle i encourage you to keep trying man because i think that what we're seeing is that how can I say this? I feel like the the line between entertainment and therapy sure. Sure. is narrowing. So I think hmm. like like I know, I know it sounds kind of weird, but like therapy used to be therapy is the place that we used to contain all of the bad stuff in life, and entertainment used to be the way that we like the place where we keep all the good stuff in life. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you've uh, seen or heard, you know, Inside by Bo Burnham, but, but yeah. I, yeah. I think like that's a prime example of him, like in a very like entertaining and comedic way, like offering a lot of really awesome insight and even support to people who are like really, really struggling. And and so I think striking that balance between like being a place where people can come and laugh, but also like people can come and like say some heavy shit and we can all kind of laugh about it like together like that's increasingly important because i think it's these weird sure. kinds of interventions that we really need like in the mental health arena which are not just treatment it's sort of like we look at physical health you know we have nutrition we have exercise all of those things improve cardiovascular health but are not medicine the problem is that it when it comes to like mental health like we don't really have those well-developed societal like support structures which i think sometimes you'll see people like you know comedians and stuff like that i think dave Chappelle actually does a decent job of this too where he you know talks about like toxicity and like things like that sometimes you'll have you know folks that are a little bit more um you know like i think jordan peterson's another i know he's a divisive figure but i think he's like a good example of someone who's like talking about mental health without it being treatment yeah. And so I think you being able to strike that balance between like heavy and comedic is actually like really important societally. It's what we hear a lot on Twitch is that, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of streamers are there for like mental health support for their communities. Sure. Because, you know, there's nowhere else to get it. Like we're not getting enough of whatever that emotional nutrition is. So we got to get it from a dude in a green gecko costume. Sure. I, I guess I have this fear of like, uh, you know, I, if, if I if I if I ever like you know my stream just becomes, you know heavy calls and like I I, I wouldn't want to do it anymore. Sure. You know if it was like just that you know I, I I'd like to I don't know it's it's been it's been a really hard uh, sort of sort of balance of those um those things but um I I totally see what you're saying I think uh I think it's it's a good sort yeah. Of, I wants to, to learn how to strike makes sense man listen i gotta get going um for do you sure have any kind of last thoughts or questions before we wrap up uh no <coughs> i think we're we're good thank you so much for having me this was this was good yeah man I, I really loved it so two or three kind of final points one is i normally teach meditation at the end of the stream but i'm not teaching because i'm sick and my teachers have told me not to instruct in meditation when i'm ill so I apologize sure. for that. You know, if you're interested in learning something down the road, um, let us know. You should get an ac access to um, Dr. K's Guide to Mental Health because you're a guest oh, on cool. the stream. Oh, cool. Hell yeah. Awesome. Um, and there's one video in particular, if you're curious about, there's a video on Vidya and Nyan, which is sort of that information understanding thing that we kind of talked a little bit about. Um, totally. There's also some stuff about kind of like confidence and not sort of like developing the flow state and stuff like that. A lot of things that we talked about, there, I would check out the meditation portion of the guide because not as directly as we talked about it here but a lot of those concepts i think if you're curious about there's more information there are particular practices and stuff like that so i apologize that i can't teach you today um and the second thing is do you want to let people know where they can find you we posted your info at the beginning yeah of the stream, absolutely but, um tell uh, us a little i'm bit about on uh, i'm on uh twitch.tv slash lyle forever l-y-l-e-f-o-r-e-v-e-r -E -E and i'm also on uh youtube 
uh, youtube.com slash Lyle Forever. I have a podcast on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts called Therapy Gecko. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Lyle, <laughs> the number four ever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Lyle. And listen, man. Absolutely. A huge fan of your work. Best of luck to you. And, and I think just keep doing what you're doing, man, because I think the internet needs it, bro. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Take care, man. Bye. Take care, Dr. K. Hey, any recommendations on who we should raid? I'm just going to ask you. Who should we raid? raid? Oh, I don't know who's streaming right now. Okay. Uh, we'll ask chat then. Raid, raid a, a, a random. Someone with zero viewers. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll try to find someone. Right. Take care, See bro. Thanks for coming on. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Tasty Steve. <laughs>